Oh, sorry, good. So good, no worries. Um, I structure this as not really a very long lecture or like nothing too technical, more informative. So it should be all very uh, intimate, not too strenuous after 5 p.m. And, uh, and a busy week for everyone and hopefully have some discussion. And then if you're up to it, we can go to the file up afterwards and have a look there if, if you're interested and haven't seen it. Um, it is interesting. Yeah, um, fire safety engineering, what is it and why should you care about it? Which is, let's just start. Um, not that many in the room, we can take a simple sample size. Are you worried about everyday fire safety in your home and workspace, personally? Not everyday fire safety. Just something we thought about my house being on fire. Yeah, some weeks. So, some days, yeah. So, it's probably been no, you're not really worried. It's not really like a, you're not in a state of constant anguish. Yeah, it's just, it's yeah. 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 the same as like stepping into this building and worrying it's going to collapse. Exactly. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's not really like a very um, permanent fear. Um, so, you don't really perceive the risk, which means either we're not doing a very good job of advertising it, it's very rare, or we're doing a very good job at preventing it. Yeah. And yeah. this is something we're gonna talk about a bit, how, how we get to that point. And I mean, fire has always been known as an issue uh, to humanity and everything we build. So for example, this is an excerpt from Charles Dickens in 1850. Earth, air and water are necessary conditions of human life, but fire is the first great element of civilization. Fire is the best because of the most useful servants, and according to your proverb, the worst because the most tyrannical of masters. Fire, the chief friend of man in creations of nature and industrial art, yet the most potent of all enemies in destruction. When once it obtains dominion over man and men's abodes, I think that sums it up quite well because we use it a lot. We use it for cooking, uh, land clearing, um, all sorts of energy. Like if you, have a, if you have a gas heater in your home, for example, but here, as it explains, once it gets out of control, it's really hard to rein in and potentially destructive. And the thing you already drew the, the parallel between you're not really worried about the building collapse, but fire safety engineering isn't really as visible as a discipline. Because, for example, when you go to other universities, a lot of them will have a discipline on earthquake engineering or flood engineering, but fire safety engineering is still quite a rare um, field of study for students. Um, mainly because it's not that visible. For example, flood engineering, this is in, in London, uh, uh, flood protection. So these sort of things appear quite prominent, large infrastructure projects. But of course, also in this case, in flood protection, you have a lot of small details that are not visible. And we're going to talk a bit about those in the fire safety context. Um, earthquake engineering, who knows what this is? I have no idea. It's, it's like a bit down the way to moderate yeah, exactly. It's a giant pendulum up in the Taipei 101 building, so it kind of balances any vibrations you, you might get from a, from an earthquake. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's those kind of like big engineering solutions that, that are quite visible and quite popular. Or structural engineering has their bridges, and very few of them collapse these days, so we're not really that worried about it. Um, but fire safety is also in everyday life just in, in smaller measures, smoke detectors. Uh, most, most places in Australia I found are, are sprinklers. Like I live uh, in an apartment and uh, have a whole bunch of sprinklers everywhere. I found that the most critical place, which is like the TV and the couch, where I think the, the most likely ignition risk and fire load is, doesn't have sprinklers. So I uh, missed the importance for that. Um, it should, still, I mean, the point of a sprinkler is not to to extinguish the fire or to stop it from spreading. So hopefully the, the remaining ones will work. Um, building materials um, must pass certain tests so they can be used in buildings. Um, fire service is obviously a, a form of fire engineering, fire prevention, and it's, um, we cooperate with them a lot in building design to make sure everything is, is up to code and, and up to, to the relevant safety standards. Uh, escape stairs. So uh, any building cannot only rely on elevators or, or small set of stairs. We must have means of escape from our building. Um, again, uh, additional fire protection applied to materials that you might see in buildings um, and means of escape 
um, other than the way you came in or the, the main doors. Uh, so all of these are, are small things you might encounter. And of course, there's a whole lot of um, engineering science behind them, like how many stairs do you need, what material do you use to protect in case of a fire? Um, how many exit doors do I need? How big do they have to be for a particular building? Uh, can you identify those do you do fire engineers uh, decide where the doors go, or is it more like the structures? Uh, no, structural engineers wouldn't really have an input on that. It would be the architect, maybe. Oh, so the architect might already be aware of they need fire doors somewhere, and they will put them in. And then um, on a bigger building, fire engineers will run a check, and they will say, OK, you, you might put another door here to, yeah. to either comply with the code or if you want to increase the occupancy on this floor, you need to put another escape door there. Yeah. Um, so those were more, are more like almost the day-to-day -day of, of a fire engineer in a, in a consultancy. So you, you would look at the floor plans, the possible occupancy, and then see. And on the simplest case, it's quite simple. It's a room, mm -hmm. and you have certain rules of how many people are allowed in that room and how long it would take for them to get out. But um, when you look at more complex cases, it might be a shopping mall and they might ask you, oh, can I actually put a second stair from floor A to floor B? And what would that mean for the escape? And then you have to check the flows of escape and it does actually get quite complicated because obviously that impacts on, on escape routes further down. Um, um, and then we can look at how do we get to the current point of fire safety engineering. You're, it's always a good point to look at historical data. And this is from a speech given by Hotel in 1993, which now is for us feels like pretty long time away. It's almost 40 years. Um, and he pointed out that most of the important events in my area of competence have occurred in my lifetime uh, is a common failing of technical people. And he also points out that even back in the then fire insurance in America and the process with issuing fire insurance incorporates a form of fire engineering was already 200 years old. And actually, if we look back in his history, um, we can see that mass conflagrations um, have been a big problem in history. And this is really where it becomes, why is fire engineering needed? Um, for example, this is a drawing of the scenes at the Great Meriki Fire, which was in uh, modern day Tokyo. And it basically burned down large parts of, this, of the city. A lot of people died. And also it, it really devastated their economy at the point because they had to rebuild, didn't have enough wood. So they also had to change the whole way they do forestry. Um, so it had a huge impact on, on life in Japan that, that still feeds into today. And it shows that if you don't have fire engineering, fire safety engineering measures that can prevent that, um, you're gonna live with the consequences of that for, for a long time. And similar things happened all over the world. Uh, this is a replica of the Great Fire of London in 1666. And again, you can see this, this was done for the 250th anniversary. Um, so that means that even hundreds of years after the event, they're still commemorating it, which shows what a big event that was for the whole city. Again, a lot of people died and there were high economical costs that had multiple um, that had impacts for years to come for not only the city but the whole the whole country at that point um, and you can go all over the world and almost every city will have their great fire of x so in this case it's uh, the great fire of Brisbane apparently um, great fire of Chicago great fire of New York um, all sort of modern big cities in, in their growth stage had these sort of mass conflagrations and the, the reason was, I mean, one of the main reasons was, especially if you look at the United States, is you had a lot of people moving there, fast growing population, and they needed places to live. So they built a lot of kind of almost shanty towns. So um, just uh, cheap buildings, uh, timber, put a roof on, stack them close, lots of people on a small space, and no consideration for fire safety. And what happened is, uh, in a dry summer, um, either there would be an ignition source within that, within that um, sort of shanty town, or there would be uh, a wildfire nearby, which might have caused ignition. Then um, everything was destroyed, which meant these people again needed a place to live. So they rebuilt in the same way because they didn't have a lot of money. They had somewhere to live, so they had to do it quickly. And so that 
kept going and you can see actually here at the at the start when, when these cities cool so this is from the united states um so you had a rise in urban population and over came an increase in incidence of major fires and then eventually at some point they said okay let's stop it um you can see there's a big um difference now between the urban population and, and the incident of major fires which is here they decided let's take fire safety engineering measures and just change that um yeah it, it has it has worked and um, now we don't have really these mass configurations anymore at least not um in most developed cities it's still a big issue in um in um in the developed world um where you still have a lot of slums and there it, it's the same thing just different building materials these days and different circumstances but again you have people need a place to live so they will build shelters the way the best way they can and that obviously brings fire safety challenges and um, it's very different to combat that because you can't go there and tell them okay you need 10 sprinklers here you need to maintain bigger spacings you can only use materials that do not burn because those people might not have the opportunity um, and it was the same back then and hopefully at some point we'll find a solution for this modern problem in this in this old context as well um, but it's a bit of a um, thing and one thing I, I didn't actually mention in terms of fire safety engineering where you encounter it one of the big things how they achieved that fire gap um, was city planning simply by by spacing the grids a bit bigger you introduce fire breaks so you might still get a fire here in lot 28 but if you space it right it won't go to 27 25 26 and so on um so you re really you remove the threat of fire in the whole city to find an individual building and another change this was actually introduced in london after the, the 1666 the great fire of london fires that people started to use timber less and move towards uh um stone in here it was brick and then towards the 19th 20th century steel and concrete um, which are not combustible so they have less potential to spread the fire they're not 100 percent fire resistance they can still collapse and fire that's that's a different measure um, but this kind of shows how how we have developed and, and the, the techniques we have developed throughout time in terms of fire engineering and even though back in the day this might not have been called fire safety engineering because a lot of these um uh, solutions to the problems that they, they weren't part of a formalized engineering discipline but similarly you could say that for example the building of, of bridges didn't start as civil engineering it was someone had to cross a stream so first they put a put a lock over it and there was a bigger stream so they started figuring out what works and later these sort of construction were formalized in civil engineering and the same thing is now happening in fire safety engineering or has been happening for a while, for a while um yeah then so basically up to this point we've talked about um the, the almost middle ages and now the 19th century and then in the 20th century fire safety engineering um which is part of um so we have fire safety engineering part of that is fire science engineering which kind of tells you how do fires behave in a building and that then gives you the measures to implement safety measures um, effectively and, and one well, big push for that was actually this, the the world wars especially the second world war um the british and um, in general the allies did a lot of research on how do they prevent fires on the home front um very important to keep factories going but also in the us they had a big program to figure out how do we best burn cities with incident incendiary bombs and so they did whole studies where they rebuilt uh, German and Japanese towns dropped bombs and figured out, okay, what's the best way, how we can burn that, um, which at the way they had some, some successes, some failures, and in the end they got pretty good at it. Uh, but after the war, that sort of knowledge was there, but they were like, okay, we have all these people who have worked on this, what do we do with them now? And from that they developed, okay, we can actually put them to work to do the opposite, use their knowledge on how things burn to develop the fire safety science. And that's really how a lot of the fire safety programs we have today were established. So people who previously learned how to burn things then use that knowledge to think, okay, how, how can we move in that opposite direction, material selection, spacing of buildings? Um, and how can we formalize that in terms of um, engineering equations that people can use? Um, where might we encounter fire safety today? 
well, it's not only civil engineering, but if you work as a fire safety engineer, you might work um, for Boeing or Airbus or any other plane maker. It's an uh, important topic. Obviously, if you're on a flight in the air, the fire service is not around. So it's quite important to have good fire safety measures. And also airplanes often use novel materials. And you might remember that the Dreamliner actually when it started had big issues with, with battery fires arising. So that will be a fire safety challenge. Um, uh industrial applications uh i mean you'll have these sort of biggest industrial plants all over the world often they involve uh, flammable liquids or gases and then making sure that a small uh, fire or bay or somewhere doesn't compromise the whole system would be a good example of a fire safety strategy or fire safety engineering uh tunnels uh anything really where you have people in a confined space similar to the to the airplane now you have a fire in there um, you need to make sure a people get out and b the tunnel is still reasonable usable you don't want it to collapse completely after after a fire and um, for example the, the euro tunnel had two fires that closed it um, for for a few weeks or even months and that was was millions to billions in cost just to to repair that because in that time obviously you can't use it um, so that's that's a problem, and that's why part of the research. And actually, if you met Dr. Christian Maluk, he does a lot of spalling research. Um, spalling happens when you have concrete and it gets heated um, very fast in a short amount of time. Then you get bits of concrete exploding, and that's a big problem in tunnels. Um, if you've ever been in the AB Structures Lab, there's a big radiant panel, and when he moves that close to the concrete, you might see bits spalling off. Uh, trains or any sort of public transport that also feeds in tunnels but also in general you need to make sure people can escape from that um, that we have for example materials that mean that if you have a someone um, gets some fireworks gets a bit drunk lights a bit of firework in in the train that that doesn't ignite the, the upholstery and then hopefully we have designed it in a way by material selection that it doesn't spread to the whole train can still happen, but we, we want to, to minimize the risk. Uh, and then, of course, so these were examples that are not directly related to civil engineering, but also in civil engineering. So that's the uh, Pompidou Center in Paris. And at the time, there was a huge fire safety challenge because the architect wanted to have all the structural work on the outside. But Paris had these rules that they specified four hours of fire resistance um, for external elements, so that meant you would have to put huge encapsulation and protection on the outside elements. And Margaret Law, who was actually one of the leading fire engineers um, from the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and she, she, she died recently, um, she went with Arup to the uh, headquarters of the Paris authorities and explained to them, okay, with fire engineering principles, we can actually show that the flames out of the window have this shape, this expected temperature, so the radiative feedback to these elements is, is not as much to justify this four hour fire resistance rating. So we want these elements to be exposed and we don't think in case of a fire that these will collapse. Uh, there hasn't been a fire yet at the Pompidou, another notable one, so we, we don't really know if, if they were correct, but um, nothing has happened so far, so uh, touch wood and we, we have obviously they have run studies to validate the heat flux and the temperatures coming from those flames. So it starts with the theoretical assumptions. We have a structure outside with a fire in the inside. The fire comes out. What's the exposure from these flames to that external structure and how hot is that going to get? Is that heat going to lead to lead to collapse? And then from there, you can test your assumption by building a scaled model and, and, and test that. Uh, so that's a from my point of view, a very interesting and, and historical point in fire safety engineering, where fire safety engineers really, really said, okay, we're gonna use engineering knowledge, um, first principles to show that this building is safe in case of fire and we can, um, we don't need the extreme measures that are specified in the building code for this building. Um, and you have a lot of modern buildings and I just said for the Pompidou, um, there wasn't really a big, fire yet or I haven't read about anything and you could say fires are relatively rare events um, any building has a very small chance in any given year to experience a fire 
you could say like, okay, there's only so many prestige buildings. What, do you, what are the odds of them catching on fire? So that's the CCTV building in China, in Beijing, I think. And that was a couple of years ago. So these big fires happened. And um, yeah, it was actually during construction. So I don't think anyone died or uh, it wasn't like in terms of loss of life. It wasn't a big event as far as I recall, but obviously this is hugely uh, disruptive to the construction process and will introduce extra costs. Uh, so these things do happen and, and um, was it two years ago, three years ago, Notre Dame is, is another example. In that case, a historical structure destroyed by fire with those is sometimes, it's sometimes difficult because they were obviously built in a time when those fire safety engineering principles weren't that strong, um, but you still have to deal with it. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a special branch of fire safety engineering dealing with historical structures and ensuring their durability. Um, okay, what are the key tenets of fire safety today? Basically, if you were to work as a fire safety engineer, um, what are typical jobs? So what do we consider for fire safety? So let's imagine we have a tall building or building in general. Uh, that's the Mjørstonet, which is currently the tallest timber building in the world, stands in Norway. And let's imagine we have a fire somewhere. And then we need a way to raise the alarm. Uh, to raise the alarm means both informing the, the, uh, the fire service, but also informing the people in the building that it's time to get out now for your own safety. Um, in a very big building, you also have, it gets a bit more complicated because you don't want all the floors to evacuate at once. You want to move the people who are near the fire out first, and you want to maybe do a, a, a staggered approach to evacuation, because if you put all the people in the escape stairs at once, you might create a bottleneck and you might slow down the whole thing. Um, but in this case, let's just say, okay, we need measures to detect the fire and alarm the fire. So that will be smoke detectors and alarm systems is something you would be specifying as a fire engineer. And it depends on the context. In an office building, you assume people are, are there, they are awake, and they're familiar with their surroundings. Um, it's different to an alarm system and detection system that you would specify, for example, um, in, in a housing complex where people have where sleep, people sleep, or even in a hotel where people sleep and they're not familiar with the environment. They might not know what's the best way out. Um, yeah, that goes to the fire service and we need to provide means of escape. So we need to provide enough uh, egress routes that are safe in the case of fire. So um, different countries have different rules, but for example, in, in the UK, the rules would be you need 18 meters to the nearest safe point of exit for the, for the standard solution that that you're allowed to use. Um, and that, that might just be the entry to fire safety stairs. So in this case, we would just walk out of this room and into those stairs, and then we would be in, in our, our safe egress path. And then the fire service needs to have a means to, to get rid of the fire and take it, turn it off. Um, the governing principles put the wet stuff on the red stuff. Uh, but you can see here, so this is a relatively tall building and fire service applications are really um, limited by the water pressure they have and the ladder length that they can use. So generally, again, the magic number is 18 meters above that. Um, you might have a problem reaching the fire. So in that case, we need to design the building in a way that even without fire service intervention, the fire will not spread from room to room and burn down the whole building. And the idea behind that is compartmentation. So you, you build a compartment and within that, you let the fire burn and, and heat up all the fuel, um, which would be tables, TVs, sofas, depending on the context where you're in. Um, but then eventually it will hit a wall that it cannot burn. And the idea is that it burns up all the fuel inside and cannot breach that wall. And then once the fuel is gone, the fire will go out. So that's, that's really where a lot of the, the structural fire safety engineering comes in, because you need to make sure that that wall doesn't get a hole, doesn't collapse, because I mean, this is not load car carrying, I think, but it doesn't collapse while the fire is, is um, heating it from the side. Um, and then if you design that way then, and it works, then your fire safety strategy has been successful. And um, we generally assume we cannot prevent fires. So we assume ignition will happen. Um, 
but then we, we only lose that compartment. We might have to renovate that, but we don't lose the whole building. We give enough time for people to escape and we create conditions where the fire service can work safely to help to evacuate and where possible um, extinguish the fire. Uh, and so, for example, for life safety, the governing tenant is ACED versus RCED. So that means available safe equals time against the required safe equals time. So the available safe equals time as a fire safety engineer, um, you might either get them, uh, you know, in a simple geometry of a building, you can you can write a zone model. That means you calculate how much smoke is entrained by the fire you're expecting, how much smoke is generated, and how does it spread for a building. For more complicated geometries, you might use um, the fire dynamic simulator or similar uh, fluid dynamics. And basically, you assume you have a fire here, you simulate the, the temperature and air flows, and that way you can you can check. I'm not sure what they're showing here, but for example, you could check how does the smoke move through the building and what are the temperatures. So, for example, in that case, let's say you have heat um, detectors or sprinklers here, you could calculate will they activate in time to actually stop this fire from spreading, or you could simulate when does the smoke get into the next room and what does that mean for the occupants there. So that's our available safe equals per time. How much time do I have before situations become untenable for the people in a building? Um, to counter that, that's something we touched upon earlier, like how many people do you have in a room, how fast can you get them out, and like I said, there are simple hand calculations you can use as um, empirical correlation to say this is how fast people move down a, a set of stairs, if you get too many people, so you create a bottleneck, and obviously in more complex geometries, it kind of gets very convoluted soon because you have different flows from different floors, People might not always choose the exit that's closest to them if they're not familiar with it. People tend to go out of the building the way they came in. Um, you might notice that from yourself if you have in an unfamiliar building. Once you go out, you, you will follow the path you go in, or at least I notice that in my, in my own behavior. That will tell you that's the required safe egress time. And if you are required safe egress time is larger than the available time, that means you have to tweak your design to either get your people out faster or you have to slow down the fire spread to create tenable conditions for longer. So that's, I think that's probably one of the main things that a fire safety engineer who works in a fire consultancy does, look at buildings and see what are the life safety implications, what's the worst case fire scenario, how do we need to design exit pathways, um, what's how, how's the fire development? Um, can we specify sprinklers here? What's the benefit of sprinklers? Where do we need to cite um, fire detectors? And so that's life safety. And the next thing are firefighting and property protection, which I've kind of lumped here together because if you, if you don't get the firefighting right, um, your fire might spread and you might not be able to protect the property. And a lot of how much you need to go into that depends on where you are. Different jurisdictions have different guidelines and they will usually say something, okay, everyone has the right to escape their workplace um, in case of fire without being injured, which makes sense. So that's the life safety. And then they will also give specification. You must give reasonable accommodation to the fire services. Property protection is often not codified. Um, although if you're an engineer and you work on a big prestige building, for example, the advanced engineering building, uh, you wouldn't want a fire in one room to escalate and burn down the whole building because that is a a big issue for image and b is a big cost both in loss of the building rebuilding um yeah you don't want that to happen that's a construction site though so um which is actually a, a big issue for fires because some construction sites you don't actually have fire safety engineering measures in place yet or they're not complete yet um so and that can happen and and then lead to a complete destruction. And another thing in terms of property protection is the fire resistance. Um, so this is a, a, a little comic strip. See that? Yeah, basically about, about uh, civil engineering and bridge engineering. Obviously you study civil engineering, so you might have come across better methods than are detailed here to, to test it until failure and then rebuild it again until you have passed the heaviest truck. But really in fire safety engineering, 
if I said before, we need to make sure this wall doesn't collapse in a fire. Um, what they do is they, they use the fire resistance framework, which basically is, is a big furnace. And you can see here people shoveling fuel into that. And basically they, they kind of maintain this, this time temperature curve. You take the element you want to test, you put it in, and you see how much time it lasts. And building codes will specify, okay, this is a critical element, it needs 90 minutes fire resistance. And really the idea behind it is that I put it in a furnace and it cannot collapse or pass any heat or smoke before 90 minutes. Um, it's kind of a way to standardize uh, fire ratings because it's the same time temperature curve for all building elements, but fires are different, every fire is different in reality, but that way they have a method to rank it. It doesn't mean a real fire will behave that way. It also doesn't mean that, so this time is not real time. It basically means in the furnace, you might last 90 minutes. It doesn't mean in a real fire it will last 90 minutes. It might be less, it might be more, depending on the real fire you encounter. But it gives, a, it gives a way to rank materials and, and building elements. You can say concrete beam A um, performs better than, than steel beam C, but worse than concrete beam B. Um, whether that is actually a good approach, that's debate in the fire safety community. Uh, it has been in existence for 100 years now, and we have very few buildings collapsing. Um, whether that is because we have few fires or other good measures or whether the fire resistance works is an open question in my opinion but it has it has its use to compare but it is also compared to other engineering disciplines where you might have a scale model in a wind tunnel and you you, you put in your worst wind and you estimate the vibrations this seems a bit from the past because essentially it's the same uh principle as this. You take your element and you test it to destruction and that's your fire resistance rating. Like I said, it has its point, but if you're a structural fire safety engineer, you might also use the tools we showed earlier where you estimate the fire from that you can estimate the temperature of your material. Um, from that, you can then try to, to predict when will it collapse in this certain fire scenario, um, which would also be um, fire safety engineering, although that's quite a speciality and generally clients that sort of work will require specialized people with special skills and, and big models big computational models um, and they, they cost money so you wouldn't you wouldn't design like a small house somewhere and use these advanced fire structural fire safety calculations but you design a big stadium and it becomes very feasible because in a stadium you would never expect a fire like this and so this might not be applicable so it might make sense from a cost benefit analysis to actually put up invest more money in the structure of fire modeling and come up with a model that predicts the real fire and the real consequences and you might actually realize you need less fire protection and on a big building that can mean a lot of savings um are our efforts in fire safety engineering working uh, so these are some fire statistics I just quickly looked up and in general we have less fire death in the last uh, 40, 30, 40 years um, globally. Um, okay, this, isn't, this isn't all all over the world, um, but there is a reduction. And we can see, so this is from the home office in, in the UK, the statistics, and we can see colors on there are terrible but um you can see fire related fatalities are going down um but you can also see fires are going down and then here actually in the last 10 years we kind of hit a point of stagnation um this might mean we maybe we're not investing enough to to push that further down or we could have also hit the point where we say okay is there a point of investing any more money because eventually you you get diminishing returns and you can invest more and more money but um, if someone falls asleep with a cigarette in their mouth um, that's still burning and the fire starts in the room that they're in there might not be much you can do to counter that um, again it's an open debate going on are we doing enough how much is enough how many fire related fatalities can we accept um, the real challenge that keeps us on our toes in fire safety engineering and we need a where fire safety engineering is still relevant as a field of study is is innovation 
um, because when we when we have innovation or we have unexpected events, and that really challenges biosafety engineering. Um, obviously, you will have seen repeats of those images recently, as it was the 20th anniversary of the, the attacks on the World Trade Center in New York. And that was also a big debate in fire safety engineering because people said, well, it was terrorists, it was planes hitting a, hitting a building. Are we now designing all buildings to withstand plane impact? Uh, but we could actually see from what we've seen on TV and what happened is the planes didn't collapse those buildings, no? They, they flew into the buildings, um, they exploded and they started those fires and then the fires eventually caused the collapse. And a good example is actually, so those are World Trade Center Towers 1 and 2. So they had the planes actually take out critical columns and from the vibrations, the, the fire protection in some of the beams was, was destroyed. And that meant you, you didn't have the fire protection. Eventually the, those floors collapsed. Okay, you can, you can say if the terrorists did it, that's nothing we could do as fire safety engineers. But World Trade Center 7 didn't get hit by a plane. It was hit by debris from these towers. And those that debris hit uh, started fires in World Trade Center 7. And then those fires caused it to collapse eventually. At that point, I think people were out of World Trade Center 7, but it still collapsed and had a big economic impact. So it shows that in that case, there were really things that hadn't been considered. In World Trade Center, there were other issues as well. They didn't have enough evacuation space to get people out fast enough. Um, the firefighters had no idea that, that the towers would collapse because no one really predicted that at the point. And that has brought a huge increase in fire safety, structural fire safety engineering research. And also now our codes, building codes look very different to before that event. So it really shows you that they are still events and, and scenarios that really challenge um, um, our fire safety understanding and, and how can we make buildings safe. And again, uh, what happened when we get it wrong? Well, this is another more recent example. Um, uh, you might have seen that as well, not quite on the scale of the, the attacks in the World Trade Center, no terrorists involved. In this case, uh, I think it was a bridge fire starting it. And what happened was that the facade was flammable and the fire could spread up the facade around the building and basically the whole building burned out. So the fire safety strategy um, of we box the fire in and it will burn itself out didn't work at all. The worst thing was the, the fire services and the fire strategy relied on that and told people to stay in place. So that's why we had a lot of fatalities in here. So that really brought a rethink. Um, it has much bigger consequences even now still from that, because they realized, wait a minute, the facade system they have on that tower, we have that on hundreds of tall buildings all over the UK and the world. And um, we still have that. Um, I know the university is actually currently undertaking a review of several buildings across campus, um, looking at the materials and seeing what they need to uh, need to change. And that's one of the issues with fire safety engineering. Not fires are very rare. So when you have something going wrong, you might not notice the error until you have a lot of that problematic building system throughout the city or throughout the world in a lot of uh, housing stock. Um, because housing stock should, like a well-designed building should last 50 years or more. Um, so once we start building with a certain system, we do it and then maybe 30 years in, we have a big fire and that means um, all those buildings are now unsafe. So we have to make huge investments and changes to, to those buildings to, to, to rectify that. Um, because even though fires are rare, once these sort of things surface, they also really affect our sense of safety. And that's why I asked earlier, how safe do you feel in your building? And you said, yeah, pretty comfortable. It's not, not really a big concern, but if you see that, and then you realize, oh, I live in, the, in, a, in a building like that, and a fire could have the same consequences. And now in the UK, people still have to pay a fire guard, which is basically paying someone all night to stand around and look for fire and then warn everyone to get out in case there is a fire. Um, people who have mortgages on their on their flats, um, suddenly those flats, because insurance won't cover them anymore, suddenly those flats are worth euro dollars. Um, so it has also really big economic and personal consequences. And, and I have some friends who work as fire engineers in the UK and 
they say they have people calling them in tears saying like can you help me fix that i need this certificate for this sort of cladding system and so it's, it's a big problem in terms of how do we live and, and how do we interact and, and the economy uh we can also get it wrong by being too keen on fire safety maybe um anyone knows what that is exactly so anyone been to the shonel cinema theater um recently as that's currently closed because of asbestos and um, in the 60s 70s asbestos what is asbestos? asbestos is like a material it's like a fibrous material so it's mined um similar like similar like you would mine other materials that you, that you use it's cheap and it's really good and it's been found it's like the set microscopic way for a week but as soon as it enters your lungs it starts scratching away at the inside of the lungs it's causing the picture it's tears and yeah so exactly so in the 60s 70s 80s people thought like oh this is this is the good stuff because yeah like it grows in the ground basically you just take it out put it in the buildings good insulation no problems with fire safety um yeah okay i mean it probably has saved a few lives over the years in terms of fire safety but it has killed and, and injured and reduced quality of life for many more people than we have saved so that's another issue with with what happens in the building stock um, obviously that doesn't only apply to fire safety engineering but any sort of materials that we might use for example to uh, reduce heating losses in a building to increase its sustainability um, if we rush into a material that we do not understand the, the, the holistic implications of that material then we might come to regret it and that's why studying these materials both from a fire safety perspective but also thinking about the implications um, for other health-related measures or even economic measures are quite important. And future developments and challenges in fire safety engineering are, for example, timber on the uh, drive for sustainability. People are now very, very keen on building buildings of timber. This is a proposal for a building in Japan. They want to build it not until 2054, I think. Um, but I mean, it's, it's more a thought piece, and I don't think it will be built like that because that, in terms of that configuration, it's almost like building like a little house for matches. And, and I mean, this is obviously uh, a very big building, so those building elements will be massive, and people have this kind of conception that, that yeah, mass timber actually works quite well on fire because you get that charring rate, but it's all about scale, no? So if I look at that, it looks like a matched house. If you have a big fire there, um, it will still spread um so that's that's a big issue that's hotly debated at the moment architects love it they love the timber and as a fire safety engineer um we often have to rein them in a bit and say like okay you need to consider the consequences of what you're doing in terms of fire and then they say oh no but it's mass timber it's fine it's just gonna char and then you have to say like well but to char it needs to burn which means it releases heat and then they will tell you like, oh, but steel just collapses in fire, like in the World Trade Center. It's like, yeah, but you cannot compare the two. That just because steel is bad is not perfect, and fire doesn't mean timber is. They both have their individual challenges. Um, obviously, I'm not saying it's impossible. And here at UQ, we actually do a lot of research into that sort of thing. But yeah, um, obviously, again, this is like one of the examples where we have to be careful that we don't rush into a thing. And then in 30 years, we realized like, oh, that was stupid. Why, why did they start building everything with timber? Um, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm not against timber buildings, but I would like to see it done reasonably and with the input from fire safety engineers. And another thing, uh, e-bikes, uh, electric cars, any sort of thing that has a battery in it, um, I mean, it, it kind of reflects a change in lifestyle and different ignition risks. Um, yeah, I once spoke to someone from a fire service and it says one type of fire service really disappeared because people used to do the thing where you had like a big TV and they put candles, like little tea lights on top of the TV, just like a nice illumination. And what happened is eventually that tea light gets hot, melts the, the cover of the TV, falls into the TV, starts a fire. Now we have flat screen TVs everywhere and you can't really balance a candle on there um some people might still try and that might cause a fire but it has really um really removed this sort of ignition risk and on the other hand today everyone has a smartphone if not two a laptop so all of these have batteries all of these have chargers um so that introduces new ignition risks 
that we need to be aware of. And a battery fire is different from, from other fires in terms of um, that can be quite intense. And also, for example, the fire service are, are concerned in terms of monitoring hours they need to put in because if an electric vehicle burns, they need to use more water and they need to actually monitor it for um, a day or even two to make sure the fire doesn't come back up. Again, I'm not saying we should stop having electric uh, vehicles. Um, they're, they're probably a good solution to a lot of other problems, but we need to consider the fire safety implications. And yeah, in conclusion, fire safety engineering has been around for a long time, even though it might not have always been called that or hasn't been formalized. Um, it's a multidisciplinary engineering branch, so you might work with mechanical engineers. You need some knowledge of, of uh, civil engineering. Um, you might work with architects in terms of how, how am I arranging the layout, uh, chemistry, what's in this material that can combust, how does this affect the heat, um, innovation challenges, the progress we have made in terms of safety. Um, and when we implement fire safety measures, or if we don't implement them, have a long lasting impact on life simply because the way the building stock and the life cycle of building works and the way that remediation might be expensive if we don't spot these issues early on. As actually one of the problems is that a lot of the other disciplines treat fire safety engineering as an afterthought. Usually the architects and structure engineers get together, design the building, uh, get the, the mechanism for, for the um, uh, ventilation systems uh, and whatnot. And then in the end, we're like, oh yeah, we need to fulfill the code fire safety engineering. And then they might go and call a fire safety engineer. And obviously, the earlier you get the fire safety engineer involved, the more they can do to help you. But sometimes it's just a simple thing. It's like, okay, changing the opening factor on a window to change the ventilation, which means a fire will, will either burn far out faster or might not, um, you might not get enough smoke accumulated to affect your egress times. Um, in a negative way. So there's a lot of design challenge, like simple design changes that can have a, a positive impact in terms of the fire safety. Any questions so far? Thank you for coming. Uh, should I stop the recording? Um, interesting one. In terms of climate change, you can't really predict, especially like the bushfires that came through in New South Wales, like the start of 2020. How do you factor that in? Yeah, I mean, I haven't even talked about bushfires, they usually, it's more ecologists and people work in geography that deal a lot with bushfires and the fire service itself, civil engineers do not get involved that much in it because it's often we work on like a big building in the city um, because that has, like I said, that has high value and there's a lot of benefit from getting fire safety engineers involved. But actually my research, I work a lot with timber and how can we use it in bushfire affected areas and you're right, climate change is a big problem because it, it causes bigger fires, um, probably more frequent fires, and that's an issue. So we need to consider that in the way we construct things. And it might mean in some areas we can use less timber, or you might not be able to use some timber species anymore. Um, you might have to use some some extra protection measures for that timber. So yeah, it, it is a big issue. And so it might just result in zoning changes or something. That as well, yeah. yeah. I mean, in Australia, we, we calculate the PL, which is push by attack levels, and they depend on where your building site sits. So if you're somewhere in the bush with a lot of nice vegetation around and on a slope, your PL flames are most likely, which means if you're in the path of the fire, the flames are actually reaching your house. If you're somewhere in a field, um, you can clear the surrounding area, um, you might get to PL 9 or uh, 19 or 29. And then you can, there are certain restrictions on the building material. So if you're in flame zone, you have to test your building materials according to a certain standard. And it means you cannot get 
smoke or heat into the house. Um, really at that point, you need to put a lot of measures into the, the class of your windows and, and certain things. But in DL19, you, you get away with, with having exposed timber and, and a, lot of, a lot of things that, that you wouldn't be allowed to build in DL flame zone. Of course, again, a lot of these changes were implemented relatively recently of the different zones and what is allowed. And it will take a few years until we see them popping up in the building stocks as people build new buildings according to the new rules. And then we have to wait for the fires and see how effective were they. Yeah, yeah. I, I also lost my perform for the fact that fire engineers come at the end. When I think you should get the solid goal. Yeah, I mean, it depends who you work with. Some people are quite good at it, and most yeah. most big engineering companies like our WSP, they have specialist fire safety mm -hmm. engineers in house that deal with that, and then they might also refer it. Yeah. But it can also happen that I know, for example, sometimes our might bid on the structural part of a building, mm -hmm. they might try to get the fire engineer in, but then in the end, the contract for the fire safety engineering goes to another company, so they kind of have to work together. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is getting better. I think that fire safety engineering is, is being included early on. And I think it's in Victoria, New South Wales, is now bringing a new regulation that means yeah. every building has to have uh, a fire safety professional involved at some point. That doesn't mean you have to do a big fire safety strategy. It could just mean that at the start of the building, you you send it to a, to a fire safety engineer and they say, OK, this all seems to conform to the code. I don't see any deviations. Just go ahead, sign. Here's my fee for like two hours looking at that, and that's it done. But it is a way to 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 spot potential issues early on. Yeah, that was my next question, actually. Um, in terms of the poison management side, um, how like in like in terms of regulation as well, like how much involvement do do fire safety engineers have like in green regulations? Uh, so in Queensland, it kind of depends on the building, so what class of building you have. So if you have a sleeping risk, um, you have to maintain certain zones. It depends on how much knowledge does the architect have. Are they, if they build like a box standard building and they, they know how to read and interpret the building code, they can, they can get away with a um, DTS solution, so deemed to satisfy, right. which is basically because I said the building regulations might say something, okay, you have to evacuate people safely. The DTS solution gives you kind of a, a blueprint to do that. In the, in the, and in that case, if you follow that, um, you're, you're innocent under proven guilty. But if you deviate from that, you have to prove that your design is safe. So then, yeah. you, you, then you're guilty until proven innocent yeah. as kind of in terms of the principle. In Australia, it's a bit of a mess um, because different states have different regulations and different so levels of certifications for fire safety engineer. So, you also have to take yeah, exactly, and, and a different process. And at the moment, there's actually big changes underway where they're pushing for more um, um, professionalism of the discipline, so that you need more registered engineers. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you already have a lot of people working in the industry who might not have a formal education. They, they know their stuff. But you need to give them a pathway to tick that box. That's actually something that I'm not sure if you've met uh, Dr. David Plan. Yeah, I have. Yeah, he, he, he works a lot with that to make sure that we have different options where people can upskill or, or show their knowledge and then work as fire safety engineers as intended by those changes in, right. in the law and, and where they come from. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate it. Cheers. Yeah, I think.